Now the part of the chapter that I wanted to focus on this morning is in verse 17 there where the Bible reads, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So the Bible's warning us here in verse 17 that there are many people out there who corrupt the Word of God. And what I want to preach about this morning is the subject of the modern Bible versions that are out there that are doing just that. They're corrupting the Word of God. And I'm explaining this morning why we as a church are King James only, why we only preach and read from the King James Bible. Now the Bible's warning us here. There are many people that do corrupt the Word of God. And he says, we're not like them. Now, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but the very first thing that Satan did was he attacked the Word of God by causing man to question whether that was what God had really said. In Genesis 3, 1, the Bible reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So right away, he's questioning God's word. He doesn't just start out by coming right out and saying, hey, God didn't say that. He just puts a little question and just says, well, is that really what God said? And then a little bit later on, he goes all the way to the lie where he just says, you shall not surely die. Okay, but the devil wants to put a question mark where God puts a period. The devil wants to get us to doubt what he said. And when there are over 400 versions of the Bible in English that all say something different, can you see how that would create a lot of doubt in people's minds as to what God actually said? What God really said? And so the devil is, uh, He's in the business of trying to confuse God's people, trying to confuse the world around us by creating all this uh, confusion, all these different versions, and nobody knows which one is the right one, and so on and so forth. Now, there's an agenda today, and it's a satanic agenda to change the Bible. A lot of people just think, well, the King James Bible is a great translation. It's, it's very poetic, and these other versions are inferior. Maybe they're not as well translated. But I'm here to tell you, it goes much deeper than that. These new versions are actually Satan's attempt at corrupting the Word of God. I'm going to show you that these changes are not just accidental. They're not just minor, inconsequential changes. I mean, these changes are strategic changes. They are calculated to attack specific doctrines that the Bible teaches. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible teaches us there, there are rulers of the darkness of this world. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. There are people who have many millions and even billions of dollars who have an agenda to put out corrupted Bibles and then promote them through advertising, promote them through retail stores that will put them front and center and that will show people this is the Bible you ought to be reading. Get rid of the King James Bible. Get the newer, better, improved version. Now, I did some research on what the most popular versions are today. This is the most current list. These are the statistics from 2012. I checked this with a bunch of different sources, and they all came up with the same five Bibles as being the top five Bibles that are sold today in the United States of America. The number one Bible today is not the King James Bible. It's the New International Version, the NIV. The NIV is the number one Bible today because it's been pushed and promoted by the Christian bookstores, by evangelical churches, evangelical leaders, and it is now number one. Number two is the King James Bible. Number three, the New Living Translation. Number four, the New King James. And number five, the English Standard Version or the ESV. Okay. Now, Different lists I looked at had those in a slightly different order, but they all had those five. So I could get up this morning and preach against all 400 and some false versions, but obviously I don't have time to do that. It would make a lot more sense to just focus on the four corruptions that are the most popular, the ones that are the most prevalent. The, b number one is the NIV. That's what I'm mainly going to focus on. It's the number one bestseller. And then after that, I'll focus on the New Living Translation, the ESV. And then uh, probably tonight is when I'm going to get to the New King James Version, the so-called New King James Version. 
although it was produced several hundred years after King James' death. So I don't know how there could be a new King James Version. But anyway, uh, there are so many hundreds of Bibles. It's total confusion. It's total madness. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these Bible studies where everybody's got a different version. I remember when I was a teenager, I went to some Bible studies like this, and we'd go around the room and we'd each read a few verses. Everybody has a different version. Sometimes the Sunday school teacher would start to teach a lesson, and the whole lesson would be based on a phrase that's not found in like 75% of the people's Bibles that are there. And they're confused. They can't even follow the lesson. It's not even making sense to them because of the fact that everybody's got a different version. 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now, let me just start out with the most obvious thing that's wrong with these modern versions. Uh, and, and specifically, I'm talking about the New Living Translation, the NIV, and the ESV. First of all, the NIV is missing 16 entire verses from the New Testament. I mean, just right out of the gate, before we talk about all the thousands of changes, just 16 verses are completely missing. Matthew 17, 21, gone. Matthew 18, 11, gone. For the Son of Man has come to seek, to save that which was lost. Gone. Acts 8, 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that verse is gone from the NIV, gone from the ESV, gone from the New Living Translation. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Gone from these modern versions. 16 verses right out of the gate, just gone. And not only that, but when you're reading in Matthew 17, for example, it'll go verse 19, verse 20, verse 22. It'll just skip right over it. And people don't even notice. One of the ways that they've concealed this is by putting the scriptures in paragraph form. Because when you're reading in the King James Bible, all the numbers are lined up on the left-hand side. So if you skipped over a number and you went like in Acts 8 from verse 35, 36, 38, people would notice a little more easily. But they put it in paragraph form and it conceals the fact that entire verses have been removed. But not only have 16 entire verses been removed, but there are many hundreds of other places where large phrases and large chunks are removed that are almost as large as a verse. You know, between a couple verses, whole chunks. For example, in Mark 6, verse 11, the whole verse isn't gone. But let me tell you what is gone. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's a pretty substantial chunk that's gone. So even though we say, well, there are 16 verses missing, there are other hundreds of places where it's, it's tantamount an entire verse that's been removed. When you look at these huge phrases that are gone, Revelation 1.11 removes, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. 1 John 5.13 removes, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Matthew 19.9 uh, removes the phrase, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Okay, so huge chunks, huge phrases, entire verses are removed, and they are calculated changes to the Bible. The thing I want to focus on, first of all, is the changes that are made to directly attack Jesus Christ. Just to directly attack the deity of Christ and to attack the fact that Jesus Christ is God. We believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. This is something that these modern versions constantly change and attack. Let me give you some examples. First of all, turn to 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, the first way that they attack Jesus Christ's deity is by omitting or removing some of the most powerful proofs that Jesus Christ is God. They remove some of the verses that are the most hard-hitting about the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. The deity of Christ is removed by removing some of the best examples of it. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, we already covered, is totally gone. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, that's not the only verse on the Trinity. We've got many other scriptures on the Trinity, but that's the best verse on the Trinity. Yeah. It's the clearest. It's the most powerful, most hard-hitting, and it's completely gone from the new versions. Look what they've done with 1 Timothy 3.16. The Bible reads, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Watch this. God was manifest in the flesh. 
justified in the Spirit. Now look, have we changed subjects when we get to justified in the Spirit? No, God is the subject of this whole sentence. It says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Look, it was God that was believed on in the world. It was God that was received up into glory. It was God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible is crystal clear in 1 Timothy 3.16 that Jesus Christ is God. No way around it. This is a crystal clear verse. Okay, let's hear what the NIV changes this to. I'll read it for you from the NIV. Beyond all question, you're looking down at your King James Bible. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He, listen to this, he appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit. So now, instead of saying God was manifest in the flesh, it's just he appeared in the flesh. Well, who's the he? Well, the he could be referring to just Jesus Christ from a few verses earlier. Okay, Jesus Christ appeared in the flesh. Does that prove that he's God? But when you read the King James, it says God was manifest in the flesh. That does prove that Jesus is God. See how they've removed one of the most powerful proofs in the Bible of the deity of Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, I thought the NIV said he appeared in a body. No, you're on the 1984 NIV. Nobody told you that the NIV was completely overhauled in 2010? and that now they're on the 2010 edition of the NIV. I mean, the NIV is constantly changing. All these versions are constantly changing. So I'm trying to be as up-to-date as I can with this sermon by giving you the 2010 edition of the NIV. Instead of saying he appeared in a body, it says he appeared in the flesh. Okay, now listen to the ESV. You're still looking down at 1 Timothy 3.16 in your King James Bible. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Okay, listen to the New Living Translation. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. So see, they just replaced God with Christ just so that there's no question that the antecedent of He is not God. They're saying Christ was revealed in a human body. Okay, does the statement Christ was revealed in a human body prove the deity of Jesus Christ, that he was God? But does the King James reading? Absolutely. Okay, what about Hebrews 1.8? Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. While you're turning there, I'll give you another one. You turn to Hebrews 1.8, but the Bible reads in, in Philippians 2.6 about Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So that's saying that Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He wasn't taking anything away from God or stealing anything by being equal with God because he was equal with God because he was God in the flesh. Whereas in the ESV, the Bible cha the, the ESV changes it to who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So it's kind of saying, well, he was in the form of God but he wasn't quite equal with God. So again, it's another weakening of the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Look down at your Bible there in Hebrews 1.8. This is a pretty clear scripture on the deity of Christ. The Bible says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So what is the Bible calling the Son there? It's calling him God. It says, unto the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Okay, listen to the NIV. It says, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then as you continue on, it talks other things, therefore God, even thy God, and so forth. And so from the NIV and the ESV, you could make a case, well, this isn't calling Jesus God. Because this is just talking about Jesus, and in verse 9, that's the part that applies to Jesus. That's what they would say, people who would attack the deity of Christ. Whereas in the King James, you can't misunderstand it. It just says, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And it's super clear, you go back and cross-reference it in the book of Psalms, everything fits, everything's perfect, but not in the ESV, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. 
So not only do these modern Bibles remove a lot of the clearest scriptures that tell us of the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus Christ is God. The ESV flat out says he's not equal to God in Philippians 2. But not only that, but they attack Christ's virgin birth. Go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter number 2. Of course, we know that the, the King James Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And by the way, this is something that the modern Bibles have always tried to attack. The fact that Jesus Christ was, was born of a virgin. For example, the American Standard Version, which the ESV says in the introduction that it stems from the American Standard Version, that it's picking up the torch of the American Standard Version of 1901. And in the American Standard Version, instead of saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, they change that to, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. Yeah, that's a miracle, right? Young women don't conceive every five minutes, right? But any, or less than that. But anyway, we see here an attack on the virgin birth of Christ. By the way, people flipped out about that. That's why they changed it back to virgin. Because the public just wasn't ready for that. See, the devil can't come on too strong with these changes. Because if he makes it too obvious, people are going to bristle. It's like the frog in the hot water. He has to slowly acclimate you. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the field. He started out by just questioning, well, is that what God said? I'm not saying he didn't say that, but is that real? Are you sure that's what he said? He starts out being subtle. And a lot of these changes are very subtle. In fact, most of the changes are very minor, subtle changes. I'm showing you some, of the, some big changes, but the most dangerous changes are the subtle little changes who by themselves may not seem to affect doctrine that much, but when taken in the aggregate, when you look at all thousand of them, they all work together to deceive you and to give you the impression of false doctrine. Look at Luke 2.33. The Bible says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The NIV, on the other hand, and the ESV, and the New Living Translation say, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So right there we see that the NIV and these other modern versions are calling Joseph the father of Jesus Christ, something that the King James Bible is careful to never do. Always being specific and saying, you know, hey, Joseph was the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus Christ. And that Joseph is listed separately, Joseph and his mother, not father and mother, because Jesus' father is God. In fact, later in this same chapter, Mary refers to Joseph as Jesus' father. And he corrects her immediately. Okay? Because, you know, basically he says in verse 48, look down if you would at 48. It says, When they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So didn't she just refer to Joseph as Jesus' father? Watch how he immediately corrects her. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? He's saying, look, I'm about my father's business when I'm preaching the word of God because Joseph is not my father. God the father is my father. And look, people who, who believe the NIV, they're so blinded. I've actually had them show me this and say, See? This is the Bible calling Joseph Jesus' father. No, that's Mary calling Joseph Jesus' father. And she's immediately rebuked. And somebody needs to rebuke the NIV. Yeah. Somebody needs to correct the New Living Translation. Somebody needs to rebuke the ESV and say, wait a minute, you're wrong. That is not Jesus' father. Jesus' father is God the father. And when you look at Luke chapter 2, verse 33, that's the narrator speaking. That's the Holy Ghost speaking. You think the Holy Ghost is going to make that kind of a mistake? And called Joseph Jesus' father? No way. But these modern versions have corrupted the virgin birth by stating that... Jo and then you say, well, but there are other places that call Joseph... Or, I'm sorry, there, you say, well, there are other places that call Jesus, you know, the Son of God in the NIV. Well, then you just have a contradiction then. You just have a Bible that doesn't add up. Not only that, go back to Micah 5.2. Micah chapter 5.2. Not only do they attack Christ's deity, they attack his virgin birth. You say, well, they're just a little easier to understand. Well, the changes don't really affect doctrine. These are some pretty important doctrines, aren't they? The deity of Christ, the virgin birth. Not only that, they attack 
His eternal pre-existence. See, Jesus Christ did not come into being in Bethlehem's manger. Jesus Christ did not come into being in the womb of Mary, but rather Jesus Christ has always existed and always will exist. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the ending, and that's crucial to his deity. If he's a created being, he can't be God. But the Bible's very clear that he uh, existed even before John the Baptist. John the Baptist was conceived three months before Jesus, right? And yet he said that he's preferred before me, for he was before me. John the Baptist taught that Jesus existed before him. Not only that, the Bible says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Later in the chapter it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ existed before the world began. He has always existed. He existed in the beginning. He is the beginning. He is the first. He is the Alpha and Omega. The Bible says in Micah 5 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, watch this, from everlasting. So this is telling us that Jesus Christ's goings forth have been from everlasting. Now, everlasting means it goes on forever, it lasts forever. So from everlasting would be something that comes from the eternal past or something that, that comes from the infinite past, something that has always existed. The Bible uses this term about God in the book of Psalms a few times, from everlasting to everlasting, it says. And here we see that Jesus Christ's goings forth were from everlasting. Listen to the NIV. But you, Beth, look down at your Bible. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, what's the clan have to do with it? You know, I thought it was tribes, right? Tribes or thousands. You know, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Watch this whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, what's an origin? That's when something starts to exist, isn't it? When something originates, that's when it starts to exist. Look, did Jesus start to exist at some point? No, he's from everlasting in the King James Bible. But according to the NIV, he had an origin. I don't know how you can have multiple origins. I mean, how many times did he originate? But it doesn't even make sense. But it says, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, is from ancient times the same as from everlasting? I mean, ancient times doesn't mean that it was before the world began. Ancient times could just be a long time ago. So this is an attack on the deity of Christ. The New Living Translation says, one whose origins are from the distant past. That's saying that Jesus Christ is a created being that he originated in the distant past. The King James says he's from everlasting. He it had no beginning, no ending. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Of course, DNIV removes Revelation 1.11 where he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. That's also taken out. Not only that, but in Matthew 5.22, we see an attack on Jesus' sinless life. Go to Matthew 5.22. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was perfect in every way. He was without sin. The Bible says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. Now, one of the things that Jesus did do was that he became angry. There are instances in the Bible where Jesus Christ became angry. Is it always a sin to be angry? No. no. And we know that when Jesus became angry, it was justified. Now, the Bible does talk a lot about anger being a sin because in many circumstances, anger is a sin. In many other circumstances, anger is justified. And so we know that because Jesus Christ was without sin, his anger was justified. For example, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, when it says, when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. In Mark 3, 5, it's talking about Jesus being filled with anger, looking on people with anger. Do you think he was angry when he made a whip and drove out 
the money changers out of the temple, flipped over the tables, dumped out the money, drove them out. He was angry. The Bible flat out says in Mark 3, 5 that he was angry. And yet in Matthew 5, 22, the King James Bible says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, and what are the next three words? Without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So the Bible's not just telling us, hey, anger is just wrong in general. No, it's saying that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, that you're in danger of the judgment. The NIV changes this to, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And we know that Jesus Christ was definitely angry at times. That would make Jesus a sinner, according to the NIV. ESV is the same thing. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. New Living Translation. But I say if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. The New Living Translation takes it even a step further to where it's not even about being angry at your brother. It says if you're angry with anyone, according to the New Living Translation, you're in sin, according to the New Living. I mean, that would make Jesus a sinner. God's angry with the wicked every day. And you know what? The Bible commands us, be ye angry and sin not. So if anger is a sin, how can you be angry and sin not? Uh, it's, it's interesting too, I don't know if you picked up on that, but the NIV is continually uh, trying to be gender neutral. I don't know if you noticed that, but whenever the Bible says brother, brethren, son, it always changes it to a gender. They're just adding words to the Bible by saying, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, they just keep adding in or sister and sisters, so, you know, uh, just to try to make things as gender neutral as possible, which frankly is not the way the original is written. That's not the way it's written in the Greek. That's not the way it's written in, in, in the Hebrew. They're just putting that in just to make it sound a little more gender neutral and, and happy for you. But anyway, uh, not only do they attack Christ's deity in all these ways that we've mentioned by, by taking away some of the strongest evidence, by attacking the virgin birth, by, by saying that he had an origin and attacking his pre-existence, by attacking his sinless life. What about the fact that they keep removing instances where he's worshipped? Many times, for example, in Matthew 8, 2, Matthew 9, 18, 15, 25, 18, 26, 20, 20, Mark 5, 6, 15, 19, where it says that people worshipped Jesus, that's removed from the NIV. It just says, well, they just kneeled before him. And the reason it's significant that Jesus is worshipped is that the Bible says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And whenever you see the apostles being worshipped, they're always telling people not to. Yeah. Telling them, stand on your feet. I'm a man like you are. Don't worry. But we see Jesus over and over again always receiving worship. Yeah. Yeah. Allowing people to worship him. He never rebukes anyone for worshipping him. And even when the Pharisees and the Sadducees tell him to rebuke his disciples when they're worshipping him, he refuses to rebuke them because he is worthy of all worship. And when people worshipped him, he received that worship. He accepted that worship. But when you take out most instances or many of the instances of Jesus getting that kind of worship and receiving that kind of worship, you're just putting another, another chink in the armor of Christ's deity. You're just taking away more and more evidence of Christ's deity. It's a calculated plan. And the, the editors of the NIV, they translate the same Greek word as worship in other places. But then all these instances where Jesus is being worshipped, they, oh, they just they kneeled. Other places, the same word is translated as worship. But they're just trying to remove as much evidence of Christ's deity. You say, well, but there's still some evidence left. That's because the devil's subtle. Yeah. He doesn't take all the evidence out, but he takes out a huge chunk of it. He weakens it, waters it down, softens it, so that it's harder to prove the deity of Christ and it's easier to, to make an argument against it. Okay, it's a book of contradictions, it's a book of lies. But, okay, Ephesians 3.9. Go to Ephesians 3.9. And while you're turning to Ephesians 3.9, let me mention to you that another way that they chip away at the deity of Christ is by continually downgrading his title. You know, the, the King James will say Jesus Christ, they'll shorten it to just Jesus. 
the King James will say, Lord Jesus Christ, they'll just shorten it to just Jesus Christ. You know, it'll say, Lord Jesus, they'll just change it to just Lord or just Jesus. Just constantly downgrading his title uh, by omitting Jesus at least 15 times, Christ at least 25 times, Lord at least 16 times. You know, just in regard to the Lord Jesus Christ, they're constantly downgrading his title, removing just one word at a time. Here's an example. 1 Corinthians 15, 47, in the King James says, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lord from heaven. The NIV just says, The second man from heaven. But it cuts out that he's the Lord from heaven. It just says he's just from heaven. Just another place. And I mean, we could go on and on and on. I just want to show you quickly in Ephesians 3, 9, it says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1, all things were made by him. Okay? It was all created by Jesus, by the word of God. Colossians 1 also teaches that the world was created by Jesus Christ. In the NIV it says, to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry, or I'm sorry, the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. They leave off by Jesus Christ. It just says God created all things. Now, this is the last thing I want to show you about the NIV and these other versions' attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Isaiah 14, 12. Isaiah chapter 14, 12. I mean, we've already seen a very calculated, strategic attack on Jesus, attack on his deity, taking out titles like Lord in a lot of instances, uh, uh, removing powerful scriptures that clearly showed beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God, those are just flat out removed or changed or altered. We saw an attack on the virgin birth. We saw an attack on his sinless life. We saw an attack on his pre-existence and even coming out and saying, hey, he had an origins from ancient times, admittedly, but origins nonetheless. Attacking the fact that he's the creator. Just removing one more piece of evidence but this is where the NIV really just delivers the coup de grace. I mean, this is where the NIV is just ready to just completely assault Jesus more than ever. Now, to give you a little background on this passage, Isaiah 14, let me first of all read for you from Revelation 22. You can stay there in Isaiah 14. But in Revelation 22, 16, the Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus says, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now the NIV basically says the same thing. Let me pull out the non-inspired version here if I have it handy. And I don't have it handy. I thought I did. I thought I had them all stacked up. But basically, it says the exact same thing. If you look it up in the NIV, he says, I'm the root of David and the morning star. He says, I'm the bright and morning star. So both the King James and the NIV in Revelation 22, 16 state that Jesus Christ is the morning star. Okay? That's how that term is used. Now look at Isaiah 14, 12. The Bible reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, in this passage, the Bible is talking about the fact that Satan is fallen from heaven because he wanted to be God. He said a few verses down, I will be like the Most High. It's explaining how his heart was lifted up with pride and basically how he fell from, from his position of being the covering cherub and so forth. This is showing us how Lucifer basically became Satan. And pretty much anybody you talk to knows that Lucifer is Satan. You know, and you hear of people that are Luciferian. And anybody who says they're a Luciferian is basically saying they're a Satanist, they're a Satan worshiper. Now, where does the term Lucifer come from? Isaiah 14, 12. Only one place in the entire Bible do you find the word Lucifer, once. 
Because over and over again, we see the term Satan. Well, you know, Satan or the devil is more of just a title. Because it says that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Because Satan means basically your adversary or one that's against you, your opponent. That's what Satan means. We know that devil is a general word because it also refers to other devils. Besides just Satan himself, it refers to other devils. Here we actually put a name on Satan in Isaiah 14, calling him Lucifer. Okay, And if we were to walk down the street and just ask people, you know, do you know who Lucifer is? Who is Lucifer? What is Lucifer? They'd all say, it's Satan. It's the devil. Everybody knows that. And the reason they know that is from Isaiah 14, 12. This is the only verse that reveals that name. Listen to the NIV. The NIV, you're looking down at your King James Bible in Isaiah 14, 12. The NIV in Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. So, Instead of Lucifer being cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14, 12, in the NIV, you have Jesus being cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14, 12. And why is he being cast out of heaven? You follow along in your King James. I'll read for you from the NIV. How you've fallen from... We're in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit enthroned on the amount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I've never heard of Mount Zaphon, but... I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now look, the Bible has told us that Lucifer, or Satan, was cast out of heaven for wanting to be like the Most High. Wanting to be like God. Look, the NIV, after attacking Christ's deity, after attacking his pre-existence, after attacking the fact that he was born of a virgin, that he had no beginning, that he had no ending, that he was God in the flesh, it's now accusing him of wanting to be like the Most High. He is the Most High. Amen. And yet the NIV has not only attacked him, by removing all these scriptures that prove that he is the Most High, now they've just flat out said, you're going to be cast out of heaven because you're trying to be like the Most High and you're not. I mean, this is an assault on Jesus. This should show you how satanic these new versions are. When the morning star is mentioned in Revelation 22 in the NIV, saying Jesus is saying, I'm the morning star, basically what he's saying is, I'm the guy who was cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14 for trying to be like God. I mean, that's what it's like. I mean, if you're reading the NIV, you come to chapter 14. The morning star is getting thrown out of heaven. He's trying to be an imposter, trying to be like the Most High. And then you get to Revelation 22, and Jesus says, I'm the morning star. What a satanic book. This is not by accident. It's by design. The people who are behind these versions are of Satan. Satan wanted to corrupt the Word in the Garden of Eden, and we are not ignorant of his devices. He continues to work along the same lines. He continues to corrupt and change God's Word. Remember the verse we start with today? We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Right. You can see that corruption crystal clear in the NIV. But not only that, not only do we see just the all-out assault on Jesus, not only do we see the, the satanic influence here of even going as far as to cast Jesus out of heaven and accuse him of being an imposter. But not only that, we see that these Bible versions just happen to be coming out in these last days. It's interesting. And if you think about it, it seems like the, the deception in the end times and the deception in the last days seems like it really ramped up in the 1800s. You know, you look at all the main cults that started up, they all started up in the 1800s. You look at just, for example, one year, 1830. In 1830, the Book of Mormon was written. In 1830, the pre-tribulation rapture was invented. You know, in the 1830s, we have uh, the guy that we learned about just a few weeks ago, the, the, the guy who started the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, what was his name? Miller. The Millerites and this, these, all the teachings associated with that where they falsely predicted that Christ was coming back in 1844. He never showed up. But yet there are still millions of people following that religion, even though the guy was a fraud. But we see that in these last days, uh, the, the agenda of Satan to 
deceive people has really been ramped up in the last days and that's getting in preparation for the Antichrist. And I believe that these modern Bible versions are key to the devil's plan for a one world religion, a one world government, uh, a new world order. This is all part of his agenda. And the Bible tells us that before Christ's second coming, there will be a great falling away. The apostasia. The great falling away, I believe, will be facilitated by these modern versions. The great falling away before Christ's second coming will be as a result of these false, lying, modern Bible versions that are twisting and changing God's Word and changing the doctrines of Christ. And what's interesting is that people often, when they refer to the one world government or the one world religion that's coming, they often refer to it as the new world order. Right? Who's heard that term before? The new world order. Here's what's interesting. Did you know that the NIV uses the term new order about the coming of Christ? Isn't that interesting? Look, uh, look if you would at Hebrews 9.10 in the King James Bible. Hebrews 9.10. I don't think it's a coincidence that the NIV refers to the coming of Christ as the new order. And you hear about the new world order being associated with one world religion. Because look, there's a guy coming that's going to be a false Christ. Yep, yep. He's called the Antichrist. And by the way, I looked up all the NIV's references to the Antichrist, and they convolute things. For example, the Bible says anyone that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it says this is a deceiver and an Antichrist. The Bible uh, in the NIV says... The NIV says in, in 2 John there that that is the Antichrist. Anyone, this is what they say, anyone who doesn't confess that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is the Antichrist. Well, I thought there's only one, the Antichrist. Yeah. But see, it's kind of convoluted when you look that up in the NIV. It's, it's a little bit confusing. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the NIV used the term the New Order. Because it's, it's not what the text says. In the King James Bible, let me turn there myself, in fact... Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. I just, I got it memorized, but I don't want to say it wrong. Hebrews 9, 10 says, Which stood only in meats and drinks, and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now that's talking about something that already happened in the past, right? Until the time of reformation. But Christ being come, an high priest of good things to come. So if we read our King James Bible, it becomes clear that the time of Reformation is in reference to Christ's first coming. When Jesus Christ first came to this earth and instituted the New Testament, that is known in the Bible as the time of Reformation. Listen to the NIV, Hebrews 9.10. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And then if you read verse 11 in the NIV, it makes it sound as if that's something that's still coming in the future. For example, also, in the Good News translation, it says, since they have to do only with food, drink, and various purification ceremonies, these are all outward rules which apply only until the time when God will establish the new order. So again, the NIV, not as overtly, not as clearly, but if you read the context of 9, 10, and 11, the NIV makes it sound as if the new order is still coming. That The new order was not just the first coming of Christ, but that the second coming of Christ is what's referred to by the new order. The Good News translation comes right out and says it. Until the time when God will establish the new order. Okay? But not only does it use the term New Order, the New English Translation also calls it the New Order. The Common English Bible also calls it the New Order. The best-selling Bible in America today calls the coming of Christ the New Order in Hebrews 9.10. But not only that, but the NIV also, and, and these other versions, the ESV, the, the New Living also do this to a lesser extent, but they do it. The NIV also uses the term the end of the age to refer to the second coming of Christ. Now, who's ever heard of new age? Is that something that's of God? I mean, is that biblical Christianity? No. When you see the new age movement, it's... Uh, now, now, look, a lot of times when we hear new age, we just think, you know, okay, well, if I'm at the store and a drink says new age on it, it's probably a healthy drink. 
You know what I mean? Like it's probably, it's probably doesn't have any preservatives in it or something. But obviously when we're talking about new age, there are a lot of people who believe in a new age religion. And when you talk about people that are new age, a lot of times it's a merging of all religions. It's this one world religion uh, philosophy that's associated with the New Age movement, like kind of an Oprah Winfrey kind of religion of just, you know, accepting all faiths, accepting all beliefs, accepting all religion. There's no one truth, you know, what's true for you might not be true for me. And you know, there's maybe transcendental meditation involved. I'm not really an expert on New Age, but I know this, that that's not a term that the Bible uses. Because the Bible calls the second coming of Jesus Christ the end of the world. Over and over again, it calls it the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. Now, that's a lot different to say the end of the world than the end of the age. Because if you're saying that Christ's coming is the end of the age, then what you're saying is that Christ's coming will usher in a new age. So basically, according to the NIV, and according to the New Living Translation, Jesus Christ coming will bring in a new age. According to the NIV, it's the bringing in of a new order. A new age, a new order. Okay, when the Bible calls it the end of the world. Very different. It, just to give you some examples, you know, uh, in Matthew 24, verse 3, the NIV says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? He said in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. In the King James, it says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And every time it says end of the age is substituted for end of the world creating a concept of a new age, a new order. But not only that, there's a lot in these new Bibles that tamper with end times Bible prophecy in order to prepare people to accept the Antichrist, in order to prepare people to be sucked into this new world order, in order to prepare people to be deceived by this global government, one world religion, one world system of the Antichrist, and to receive the mark of the beast. Let me give you a perfect example. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there if you would. This is probably the best example of how the modern translations corrupt end times Bible prophecy. While you're turning to 2 Thessalonians 2, let me just mention to you also that the most powerful verses in the New Testament that teach us that the rapture will happen after the tribulation, like for example in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, Mark 13, those are changed in the NIV and the New Living Translation. So that the NIV says, you know, after the distress of those days. Instead of saying immediately after the tribulation, they just say, well, after the distress. Just using a more vague term so that we don't really understand exactly what he's referring to. So that we can't connect it with Revelation 7, where the great multitude appears in heaven, and it says, these are they that came out of great tribulation. And in the NIV, it says they came out of the Great Tribulation. But then they change it in Matthew 24 to just, well, it's just the distress of those days. The New Living Translation changes Matthew 24, 29 to say, after the anguish of those days. So again, just weakening a powerful clip-cut passage that says that Christ coming at the rapture is after the tribulation. No, that's now just watered down to, well, after the distress. You know, and by the way, the, the, the movie that we produced, you know, nine months ago, it's not called After the Distress. <laughs> it's not called After the Anguish, okay? It's called After the Tribulation. But anyway, so we see that in Matthew 24, another move to just kind of cloud and muddy the waters. And it's funny how they claim that these new versions are so easy to understand. But yet they cloud things. Right. They're confusing. I mean, they convolute doctrine. But look at 2 Thessalonians 2.1. This is a powerful passage about the end times. It's a powerful warning to us. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come 
except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Look, the Bible is crystal clear, and he's warning us. Look, people are going to try to deceive you about this. They're going to try to deceive you and tell you the day of Christ is at hand. That it could happen at any moment. He says, look, there's going to be a spirit that's going to try to trouble you like that. A word or even a letter as from us. Basically, he's saying counterfeit scripture. A letter pretending to be from us. Counterfeit scripture will try to tell you that the day of Christ is at hand. That it got, he said, don't let anybody deceive you. He said, look, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, that apostasy, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. How is he revealed? He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God of his worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's known as the abomination of desolation. The Bible is telling us clearly, hey, don't let anybody deceive you that the day of Christ at hand. It's not going to happen until after the abomination of desolation. The modern Bibles all completely change this passage because they are participating in the very deception that Paul is warning against. Yep. Listen, you look down at your Bible. I'll read for you from the NIV. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, you know, they always have to make it gender neutral. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word or mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So according to the NIV, the deception is not that it's at hand, that it could happen at any moment. The NIV says, well, just don't let people tell you that it already happened. Now, first of all, is that the same? To say, well, don't let people tell you it's about to happen or that it's at hand. Nope, X, Y, and Z has to happen first. To just say, well, just don't let people tell you that it's already happened. But not only that, there's another major change here. Is that they basically, instead of saying that the day of Christ is at hand, did you notice the difference there? The NIV said that don't let them tell you that the day of the Lord has already come. So this is just perfect for the pre-tribulation crowd to just completely, you know, it's perfect for the pre-tribulation crowd to just completely twist this passage to, to be compatible with a pre-tribulation rapture, when in reality the King James Version, 2 Thessalonians 2, is not compatible with the pre-trib rapture. It just isn't. So we see the deception here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Same thing in the ESV that a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. You look down at your, at your King James Bible there and at the end of verse 2. And I'll read for you from the New Living. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.2 in the King James. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim they to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't believe them. And notice, in the King James Bible, it says, let no man deceive you by any means. That's telling us somebody's going to try to deceive us. Don't let them deceive you. But in these new versions, it's just, don't be so quickly shaken or alarmed. Now, being shaken or alarmed does away with the fact that there's an agenda to deceive, that somebody's lying. See, if I shake you and alarm you, it doesn't mean I'm deceiving you. Here he's just saying, dude, just chill. Just chill, dude, because the day of the Lord, it hasn't happened yet. Okay, whereas the King James is like, look, let no man deceive you by any means, as that the day of Christ is at hand. It's not at hand, because X, Y, and Z has to happen first. So we see those uh, changes in regard to the second coming of Christ. Not only that, but in the key passage in Revelation 13, I've got to hurry for sake of time, in the key passage in Revelation 13, where the Bible tells us that the Antichrist will cause all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, all the modern versions change this to on the right hand and on the forehead. 
The reason this is significant is because we're starting to see technologies of implantable chips and implantable microchips. And it's possible that the Antichrist mark of the beast could be, and I'm not saying it is, I don't know, but it could be some kind of an implantable chip that you get when you worship the Antichrist, when you worship the beast. And so the King James Bible would have it dead on because it's in the hand or in the forehead. Whereas I heard a, a phony preacher, I forget who it was, but this phony preacher was uh, asked about the, the, the implantable chips and somebody said, you know, could the mark of the beast be an implantable chip? And he said, well, no, because the Bible is really clear that it'll be on your hand. It'll be on your forehead. So it can't be these chips. Go ahead, get implanted with them, no problem. You know, now I'm not saying that any implantable chip is the mark of the beast. Because there are people who are already implanted with chips and the Antichrist isn't even around yet. People are already implanting themselves with, with chips. But the mark of the beast could be a chip that you receive when you worship the Antichrist. Because the Bible's clear, you get the mark of the beast by worshiping the beast. By worshiping. You don't just go to the post office or go to Walgreens and just fill out a form, okay, you know, and you just you receive the mark of the beast. You have to worship the Antichrist to receive the mark. And that's a whole other sermon of itself. But the NIV makes that critical change. All the modern Bibles change it to on the hand or on the forehead. The King James, the only one that warns you, in the hand, in the forehead. Not only that, but in Romans 13. Romans 13 is the key passage that people will point to when they want to teach us to just obey government no matter what. Because there's a doctrine out there that says you must obey government no matter what. If they tell you to jump, you ask how high on the way up. I mean, no matter what they tell you to do, no matter what their rules are, we are obligated to obey everything that the government tells us to do. They have total jurisdiction over our lives. I mean, there are people out there that teach that the government has the right to regulate what I do inside my own home, what I do inside my marriage, what I do in regard to raising my children. I mean, they believe... And, and a lot of them will, will temper this by saying, well, you have to obey the government no matter what they tell you to do as long as it doesn't directly contradict Scripture. But wait a minute. What if, what if a police officer just comes to my house and says, wash my car, slave? I mean, what, does the Bible require me to obey that? Does the Bible just say you must obey that? No. Okay, what if a police officer asked me to do something illegal? I mean, what if a policeman came to me and said, you know what, I want you to, to climb over the fence into your neighbor's house and I want you to look through the window and see what your neighbor's doing. I want you to spy on your neighbor for me. I mean, do I have to obey that? Or what if the, you say, you're picking stupid examples. Right, because there's never been a government anywhere that commanded people to spy on their neighbors or else. That's never happened. Right? There's no such thing as Nazi Germany. There's no such thing as the Soviet Union. Just shut up and obey what you're told. But there have been governments all throughout history that told people, look, you're going to go to school. You're going to look at your, at your classmates' notebooks. You're going to listen in on their conversations. You're going to report back to us. Tell us what they're doing. I mean, there are all kinds of things that government could tell you to do. Now, the King James Bible in Romans 13, I don't have time to go through it completely, Romans 13 is a passage that explains to us the purpose of government is to punish evildoers. Yeah, yep. Not to regulate every aspect of our lives and tell us what to do and control us. But also a key thing that is taught in Romans 13 is that we are to obey the higher powers. Because the Bible says in Romans 13, 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be ordained of God. Now you say, what does it mean by higher powers? Well, there are various levels of power in this world that have been ordained by God. For example, the highest power is God himself. Amen. Right? Then there is human government. You know, and then in another sphere, we have the church, right? And the highest authority in the church is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church, right? Then beneath Jesus Christ, there's a pastor who is called a ruler that rules the house of God, okay? That pastor is below Jesus. That means if the pastor contradicts Jesus, we're gonna obey Jesus, because we're gonna obey the higher power. Okay, anyone who's in the military knows there's a chain of command. There is the general, and then below him could be a lieutenant, right? And then below him there could be a sergeant, but you know what? You're not gonna obey the lower guy if he's contradicting the higher guy. 
You know, if you receive two conflicting orders, you go with the high, whatever the highest ranked order that's coming at you, that's what you're going to follow. Okay, so for example, in the United States, we have various levels of government, don't we? Now, what is the supreme law of our land? Well, first of all, it's God's law. First, we obey God. If we're going to obey the higher powers, next after that is the Constitution of the United States, because the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. You say, well, you know, the Bible says to honor the king, therefore we need to obey Obama. Well, hold on a second. Is Obama the king? Is our government run as a monarchy? I mean, I thought that we lived in a free country, a democratic republic, and I thought that we have elected officials that answer to the people and that they are not above the law and that the supreme law of the land is the U.S. Constitution. And then below that, you know, we have different branches of government. We have the executive branch. We have the judicial branch. We have the legislative branch. And amongst the judicial branch, there are different levels of government. If a higher court overrules the lower court, we obey the higher court. Any law that is repugnant to the U.S. Constitution is null and void. That's the law of our land. So basically, if the Constitution says one thing, and a police officer is telling me to do something in violation of that, or let's say you are a police officer. Let's say you are a member of the military, and you're being given orders to violate the Constitution. Every policeman and every military... Uh, uh, Soldier? I don't know what, you know, every man in the military and every policeman takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. Now, if that be the case, then when they receive orders from above that are asking them to violate the Constitution, who are they supposed to obey? Should they obey their orders or should they be subject under the higher power of the Constitution? They obey the higher power. According to Romans 13, they go with the higher power. What if they're asked to do something that's against God? They go with the higher power. They go with God. So not only should we not violate God's law, if we're going to obey the law of the land, if we're going to obey the Constitution, I'm not saying the Constitution's perfect, but it is the law of the land. So if we're going to obey the government that has been set up over us, if we're to obey the law of the land, that means we're supposed to obey the Constitution. And we got to get priorities right. For example, in my home. If my wife tells the kids one thing and dad tells them something different, the Bible says that the husband's the head of the, of the home. So therefore, if there's a conflict, they go with what dad says. If there's a conflict between what dad is saying and what the Bible says, they're going to go with what the Bible says. Because we always are subject to the higher powers. The NIV just completely eliminates that teaching. Here's what the NIV says in Romans 13. It doesn't teach you to go with the higher power. It just says this. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. <laughs> so instead of saying, you know, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, there's no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God, just referring to the fact that no one on this earth has any legitimate authority except coming from God. Why do children have to obey their parents? Because God said so. Why do servants obey their masters? Because God said so. Why do we obey human government at all? Why do we even have any respect for human government? Because God told us that human government is something that we need to punish evildoers, to protect the innocent from those that would harm them. That's where that power comes from. We should obey the higher powers. And the Bible even says that it's the government's job to continually attend upon that very thing. That is their only job, to punish the evildoers. And if we look at God's law in the Old Testament, that's what he taught. But listen to the NIV. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. I I'm sorry, now I'm reading the New Living Translation. Here's the New Living Translation in Romans 13.1. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. Watch this. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now that is not true. The Bible says here that everyone in the New Living Translation, Romans 13.1, the New Living Translation is saying that everyone in any position of authority has been placed there by God. That is not true. Because one day, the Antichrist is going to be placed in authority by Satan. Not by God. The dragon gave him his authority, it says in Revelation 13. And not only that, but in Hosea, it says they've set up kings, but not by me. There are times when human authority has been placed there by man against the will of God. 
That is not a biblical doctrine. I know there are people who, who take verses out of context and twist verses to try to say that everybody who's in a position of authority has been put there by God, but that's not true. God did not put every person who's in authority in that position. He didn't do it. And so, therefore, the New Living Translation is saying in verse 6, Pay your taxes, too, for the same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to them what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. Good night. Now it's not just the taxes, it's also the fees. And those are the worst. But anyway, you just see that it's just a bolstering of this obey the government, worship the government. The King James is telling you to obey government within a certain scope, within certain parameters of what their job is, what they're supposed to be doing. And also, the whole concept of higher powers is there as a check and balance. Now, i got to quickly hurry up, but I just want to blow through this quickly. I'm going to preach the rest of this tonight. But I want to start out by just quickly giving you where the King James Bible came from. Okay, And I'm going to explain to you where the King James came from versus where all these modern versions are coming from. Because you say, why are they so different? Why is the King James so different than all these modern versions? Because they come from two completely different sources, two completely different lines of history. Yep. I'm going to go into where the, the modern versions come from more tonight. Right now, I just want to quickly give you where the King James came from. First of all, it starts with a man by the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale was the first man to translate the New Testament from the original Greek into the modern English language. William Tyndale was the one who did that. In 1925, 19, uh, 19 good night. <laughs> Let me start over. In, 15, in 1525, 1526, he put out his first New Testament. Okay, so this is a little less than 100 years before the King James. 1525, 1526, he put out the New Testament. In 1530, he put out the first five books of Moses. Went back to the original Hebrew, had to go to a foreign country to learn Hebrew, and he put out Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in 1530. Then in 1534, he put out a revised version of his New Testament. You know, he worked out some of the issues with it and improved upon it. In fact, I have a copy right here with me of basically a modern printing of the 1534 Tyndale New Testament with all the spellings updated to modern spellings, but it's word for word the 1534 Tyndale New Testament right here. Now after that, in 1535, came the Coverdale Bible. Okay, And the different thing with the Coverdale, it pretty much took the Tyndale New Testament, but it finished the Old Testament. Because Tyndale had only done portions of the Old Testament, it brought the whole Old Testament into English. So the Coverdale Bible was a complete Bible. It was Old and New Testament, 1535. In 1536, Tyndale was strangled to death and then burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church for printing the Bible into English and for teaching doctrines that they didn't approve of. Now, his last words before he was killed were that God would open the eyes of the King of England. He said, oh God, open the eyes of the King of England. Because he wanted the King of England to basically uh, mass produce or, or, or commission a Bible that would be produced and authorized and put out for the common man. Just to let you where, know where Tyndale was coming from as, as in regard to the Catholic Church, here's a famous quote from Tyndale. I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. And what he was saying was that he wanted the common man, the plowboy, the farm worker, to have a Bible in his hand. And in fact, this has even been known as, you know, the plowboy New Testament. Because this was made just for everybody, your average Joe, to have a Bible. And the Catholic Church was trying to withhold the Bible from people. Hmm, I wonder why they didn't want people to read the Bible. I don't know. But anyway, may figure out that what they're teaching is false. But they, you know, they were burning people at the stake for trying to translate the Bible into English. Okay, so he said, open the eyes of the King of England. Well, his prayer was answered just a couple years later because a couple years later, the, uh, the King of England commissioned the Great Bible. It was known as the Great Bible because when it was printed, it was just huge. It was just this massive book. 
In that was in 1536, they started working on the Great Bible. 1537 came the Matthew Bible, which was by a man named John Rogers, but he used the pseudonym of Thomas Matthew because he didn't want to get arrested, didn't want to get in trouble. Okay, the Great Bible came out in 1538. In 1560 was the Geneva Bible. This was done in Geneva, Switzerland, where people had fled from Queen Mary. They were being persecuted, so they went to Geneva, Switzerland, which was a Calvinist place where John Calvin was running the whole city. And they went there and they translated the Geneva Bible, which all of these Bibles pretty much say the same thing. The Tyndale, you can look at any of them. Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthew Bible, Great Bible, Geneva Bible. Guess what they all line up with? The King James. I mean, you look at this Tyndale Bible, it's like reading the King James. It's all the same. None, okay, all that stuff I showed you that's wrong with the modern versions, none of these Bibles had any of that. They all were with the King James on everything I've shown you today so far. These old versions, because people will say, well, where was the Bible before the King James? Hmm? What are you saying, that there was no right English Bible before the King James? No, these Bibles were all right before the King James. They were all uh, saying the same things. I mean, the language was improving. The language was changing from Middle English to Early Modern to Modern English. But we see here a continuity of God's Word in these versions, in the Tyndale Bible, the Matthew Bible. The Geneva Bible was great. Here's the problem with the Geneva Bible. It was filled with a bunch of notes. You know like study Bibles have tons of notes? It was filled with a lot of notes that were just heavily Calvinist. Heavily, uh, you know, with the teachings of John Calvin. Therefore, you know, it was just a Bible that offended a lot of people because of the marginal notes more than anything. But it was still very similar to the Tyndale Bible, pretty much the same thing. Okay, then we eventually see that the Bishop's Bible was put out in 1568. That was like a follow-up to the Great Bible an official version put out by the Church of England, put out by the king. Then when we get to 1604, we have King James becoming king. King James VI of Scotland. He became the king, and it was said unto him that a new translation should be brought forth of the scriptures. And the reason why is that you got a lot of people using the Geneva Bible, but then they'd go to church and it's the Bishop's Bibles. There were two main versions, and both of them had issues. The Geneva Bible had some issues. The Bishop's Bible had some issues. And so they said, let's just, let's just take the time to do it right and let's just make one more perfect translation of the Scriptures. They got the best scholars in the land together and they said, we're not trying to replace a bad version. They said, we're, we're, we're going from good to better to best here. I mean, these are good translations. The Geneva Bible is good. The Bishop's Bible is good. We're just going to perfect it and get it just dialed in. So from 1604 to 1610, the KJV was translated by 54 of the greatest scholars that existed at that time. Just to give you one example, one guy, Lancelot Andrews, was an expert in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Arabic, and he also spoke 15 modern languages into the bargain. But you're so much better when you go back to the Greek, right? With your little lexicon. Your pastor that can barely quote the Greek alphabet. Your pastor that can barely even pronounce the words in Greek. Who's always telling you, unfortunately the King James is a little off on this point. What it really should say. But, but this guy didn't know what he's talking about. The guy who was an expert in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Arabic, and he also spoke 15 modern languages. That's one guy out of the 54 people that translated the King James Bible over the course of seven years. That's a pretty serious translation. Do you think that kind of scholarship existed on these modern Bible translation committees? Let me help you, it didn't. Even King James himself, not that he translated it, he's not the one who translated but he did put his name on it, he did accept it and read over it. When he was like an eight-year-old boy, when King James was about eight years old, he was fluent in three languages, okay? And he learned much more as he got older. Very educated man, very smart man. Now, a lot of people will say this, and, and again, tonight I'm going to get into the modern versions, how they were translated. 
homosexuals that were on the translation committee, Dr. Martin Woodstra and Dr. Virginia Mollencott, both open sodomites, open homosexuals on the NIV committee. Okay. Uh, not exactly Lancelot Andrews. But let me say Lancelot. I mean, can you think of a more English name? But anyway, you know, the, what we're going to talk about tonight, what we're going to get into tonight, is I'm going to show you where the modern versions came from. We've seen the line of how the good versions got to us. I'm going to show you where the modern versions got to us. And then I'm also going to expose the so-called new King James. I haven't covered that at all this morning yet. But we're going to cover the new King James tonight. And then we're going to cover more the, the, the Catholic connection of the new versions. And, and that's really where it comes from. I'm going to go into all that tonight. But let me just close by saying this. You know, the King James Bible is the Word of God. It has been preserved unto us. It's been translated from the original tongues by men who prayed for three hours every day, spent many years on it, were extremely qualified, extremely educated. It is the preserved Word of God in the English language. It's without error. You don't need to go to the Greek and try to see what Lancelot messed up, and you don't need to go to the, the Hebrew. And by the way, even if Lancelot messed up, there were 53 other guys that were watching out saying, well, we're, we're looking too. They all had to agree on it. They all worked on it. Don't be deceived by these modern versions. You might be tempted one day, oh, you know, this church uses the New King James, but so what? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. We'll see more of it tonight. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for our English Bible, dear Lord. Please just help us to not be deceived by these new versions and what they're doing. Help us to study to show ourselves approved. Help us to read our Bibles and to know what the Bible says. Not to just say, yeah, the King James Bible is the Word of God, and then let it sit on the shelf and collect dust. Help us to spend time reading and studying it. Help us to love it and appreciate it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.